Welcome to another in the series of In the Boardroom. I'm David Zeidel and it's an absolute pleasure today to have Howard Saxton with us in the boardroom. I've heard Howard speak a number of times. And I'm sure you've heard him on all of his own webinars, but now he's our guest. Thank you and thank you for coming. And um, I'm sure this is going to be a really intriguing, fun session. David, thank you for facilitating and delaying your trip to Cape Town. I knew that you couldn't resist. Helene ended saying she knows I couldn't resist Howard. And I think we all feel the same. Howard is irresistible. <laughs> <laughs> and as he should say, we the people are happy that we've got Howard talking to us today. We know Howard lately from all the webinars that he's been doing, which during COVID time kind of kept us going. And it was so good that it's continuing even now. And when you listen to Howard, the, the comment I got from people during the webinars is, He's so engaging. He's so he gets so excited about talking to people. And that is Howard. Howard is the only person I know that page on Facebook is closed. Can't take any more members. And, and maybe you'll share a little bit about you have to become a public figure or something if you want to expand beyond it. One of the key things that we learn in business is networking and and how it managed to get or, or use that talent in the most authentic way. So what we're going to do is just get a little bit, hear a little bit about Howard himself, where he started, how come he's this engaging, connecting person, what drives him from that aspect? And then we'll go through some of the things the lessons that Howard feels are the biggest lessons that he's learned that he'll share with us. There's a saying, it says, who is smart? It's a Talmudic saying, I think. Who is smart? And the answer is he who learns from everybody. So Howard says he's going to teach us or share with us five lessons from five people where he's learned the lessons. I'm, I'm not sure if maths is his good suit because he said five people and then he mentioned seven names. <laughs> so it might be a little bit more. But uh, it, it's an honor for me to be interviewing the interviewer. So Howard, welcome. And we look forward to, to listening to you. And if you can just start a little bit back, maybe at school, were you the engaging person? Or what influenced you, do you think, to become a networking and connecting type of person, and maybe a little bit also around your business background, because it's not just, as we know, you've got extensive business experience, been involved in all of the businesses. Maybe start with that, and then we'll go into the lessons. Okay. First of all, uh, good morning, and thanks for giving up your morning to come talk with me, I hope. So I very much hope this is a conversation that we're going to have. Rather than a talk. So interrupt at any point in time, comments, questions, insights, please. This is actually this is really difficult because to talk about yourself is actually the most difficult thing in the world. And that's why I said today, let's actually rather pick a subject than talk about a subject. I'm much more comfortable doing that than talking talking about myself. But it would strike you as weird. You talked about the webinar series. So, so we've run 141 webinars in the last two and a half years since COVID began. And the idea was because I'm chairman of the Jewish Report newspaper as a volunteer, we said at the beginning of COVID, well, how can we help our community? How can we help South Africa? What can we do? And so long before anyone had ever heard the word Zoom or webinar, we said, okay, let's do something to inform people about COVID. And you may remember in March 2000, at that point in time, I called up a friend of mine at Microsoft um, and said, like, we want to do something to talk to people. Can I have licenses? And Microsoft said no. And then we called up Google, a friend of mine at Google, and said, can you give us free licenses? We want to do something to inform South Africa. And they said no. And I discovered this thing called Zoom before anyone had heard of it. And that's why we started Zoom webinars. 140 ago, watched two and a half million times in the 140. 
And uh, we started with doctors telling you about whether you should change your shoes before you came into the home or leave your clothes outside. That was our first one. And our second one was psychologists. How are you going to cope during lockdown? And the third one was nutrition and exercise. How are we going to eat fit and eat well? As you can see, I didn't listen. Um, uh, how we could do you could do that, and then came comedians and then storytellers. And I don't know if, how many people watch the webinars, but um, Sunday we do the winners of the Canline Advertising Awards mm -hmm. and, and Marketing with a Purpose. Um, a few days ago, we did the story of the Lost Kings of Shanghai, the story of the Sassoons and the Kachuris <laughs> who leave, leave Baghdad and become the biggest entrepreneurs in India and China in their generations, 150 years of entrepreneurship. And two weeks before that, we did Michael Medjuk, the largest ever drug bust in US history. A Johannesburg boy who grew up opposite the doll's house caught with 72 tons of hash. Um, a man that really stoked people's reactions because he had no remorse whatsoever. Not for his 14 years in a US jail, not for his seven years in a Spanish jail, mm -hmm. not for his drug dealing, not for getting caught. His only thing he regretted was the fact that his wife discovered he had a mistress in New York and that really hurt us. <clears throat> And wherever I go and people stop me on the street, people I don't know, and they want to engage about Michael Metric, the first question is, what about his wife? Did she ever forgive him? Mm -hmm. And so I actually called him two days ago, and I said, like, this is the question everyone's asking. And he said, like, well, I must tell you, he said, I've apologized, I can't apologize more, but she'll never forgive me, and I love her, and I love her till the day I die, but she just won't get over what I did. So she knew he was a drug dealer, she didn't care. <laughs> but the fact that he kept the mistress in New York was the thing that she'll never, she'll never be giving for. I'm skirting around your question, I know. But I think of myself as an introvert, which may seem very weird, but on a Myers-Briggs scale, on the introvert-extrovert scale, I'm a 28 zero. <laughs> I get my energy from people. I don't understand this thing of networking because networking seems to be something you go on to do. I've never gone out to meet people. I, I suppose some people collect stamps and I collect people. I meet interesting and fascinating people all the time and I love them and I engage with them and I learn from them. And I just came back from a trip to Morocco and you know, there are another 20 people that I'm keeping in contact mm -hmm. with the uh, camel riders through the Sahara Desert. And the deputy mayor's son from Fez who when he discovered I was Jewish, stuck me in a car and drove me off to the Jewish cemetery. So I could see, I mean, I just, I've always collected people. Around. And the amazing thing is that social media has just allowed us to keep in touch with people. You know, the fact that you can pick up your WhatsApp and call people internationally with no cost. How has that fundamentally changed our lives? When you think about yesterday when WhatsApp went down for two hours, like the world came to an end. Um, and... And the world has shifted. I, I, you know, I don't want to see pictures of people's cats, but I do want to know where they are in the world. And that's what social media has done. And I can send them a message on their birthday. And so, yeah, Facebook only allows you 5,000 friends. Everyone of the 5,000 that I have, I know personally. And I can't, if you want to have more, you have to become a public figure and have a fan page. And I mean, that's just yeah. ridiculous. So I guess I'm capped at my 5,000 and occasionally people go off off uh, Facebook and then I can take take a, a few more. But, um, but it's been an interesting journey because I think my journey, different to everyone else's journey, is that I never went into business. Business is one of the things that I do. I went to go find happiness in my life. And... I uh, I went to VITS, I did a BA and an LLB. I loved university and I hated all my studies. I was involved in politics. It was the era of, of apartheid. I was being shot at and tear gassed and chased by dogs more times than I had to remember. And that was the most exhilarating thing that could ever happen to me. The mere fact that I had to go to Lord Lectures was the stuff that interfered with my life. And so when I went out and went out, I was at work with so my law articles, and I woke up every morning hoping that it was going to be Saturday or Sunday. And I knew the moment I could get out of law, I would, if I stayed in law, I would have, I would have shriveled away and just hated my life. And I had to do something 
to, to expand my life. And I landed up in America. I did a master's in political advocacy and international conflict resolution. I came back to South Africa and I went to go run the elections. I worked at the Independent Electoral Commission for six years. I gave you peace, freedom and democracy. I hope you appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> all, the, all the bad things are that are happening are because you voted for the wrong party. All the good things that are happening, I take complete credit for. Um, but, but I woke up every morning thinking, thinking I was going to change the world. These were the first democratic elections in, in the country. Mm. And although I left that in 2000, 22 years ago, and went into business, and I'm involved in the telecoms industry and technology startups and, and in hospitality, business alone cannot make me a whole person. The chasing after <laughs> another rand is never going to fulfill me. It's one of the things I do that supports my lifestyle. And therefore, I pack my life with the things that give meaning to me. You know, the, the, the one, you all know Viktor Frankl and Man's Search for Meaning. And like one of the important lessons that comes out of that is optimists don't survive. The people who survive are the people who find meaning in the things that they do. That was one of his great insights and lessons from, from the concentration camps. And so you have to go and find what makes a meaningful difference to you. And so I travel as much as I can. I meet as many people as I can. I'm involved in community stuff. I um, During COVID, we're just talking about it now, when people were literally starving because they're unemployed. Myself and Ricky Lyons, who's been involved in all for many years until her very unfortunate death, we set up a can in, uh, in Melrose North and we, we collected 250,000 meals for the people of Clifton. <laughs> and like those are the important things in life making a difference to people's lives I, I sit on the board of Africa Tikkun and I'm, I'm pursuing an initiative that we're doing everything wrong we're getting people through school and we want them to get a job you can't get a job in a shrinking economy we're training people to be call center agents what we need to do is to be training people that they can walk out with a job in a box they need to be their own boss. And maybe that job in a box is that you train them for six months to be a massage therapist and they walk away with a massage table and a box of oils and they go start their own own uh, massage therapy. Sorry, girl, I'm not trying to take away from your business. <laughs> <laughs> but you need competition because if, if a massage cost you 150 rand instead of 800 rand, you would go every week. And in a country with unemployment rates above 40%, we need people to be able to do that. We need people to be able to be nail technicians and hairstylists and plumbers and electricians in an informal sector where people can walk out with their own job in a box. Drone parts. That's what's going to be done. You don't want to have another call center agent that's going to lose their job after three months and call you again and you're going to be rude to them because you really don't need more fiber in your home or new new cell phone contract. So we have to start looking at problems of a society really differently. And those are the things that drive me and motivate me. And being able to share some of that with you is a great honor. So Howard, and I'm sure you can all attest to this. I mean, Howard just talks and it's a story. I, I think you're a natural storyteller. <laughs> when, when did you realize that you were a storyteller? That, that it's different from other people who don't tell stories? And, and how did you develop it? I, I, I haven't consciously developed it, but I know the way I learn. And I learn by people talking to me, by telling me interesting, engaging stories. Mm -hmm. and, and in fact, if I can take an example from the last webinar that we ran, the last Kings of Shanghai, we have this guy's research, the Kaduris and the Sassoons, tells an amazing, amazing story. And I bring on Rowan Sassoon's family from South Africa who have an equally remarkable story. Yeah. And his daughter-in-law tries to tell the story and she's meandering through, and there's no story that comes out at all. There's no plot line. We all have great plot lines in our lives. It's a matter of being able to tell that story well and grippingly and being relevant to other people. So if I can tell you Rowan's story that wasn't told on Sunday night, his great-grandfather is in Baghdad at the start of the First World War. They mer Textile merchants, they're one of the biggest textile merchants in Baghdad. And at the start of the Second World War, because he deals with the British, they arrest his great-grandfather 
and they sentence him to death for being a spy. And the night before his execution, they go and they give the entire family fortune to the government in return for his release. And they hop on a boat and they escape. And where do they go to? They go to Mumbai, where the other Sassoons, the real Sassoons, have built this empire. And from there, they go they go land up in England, and they send one son to South Africa, Roland's grandfather, and one son to Ireland, <laughs> and one son to Argentina, and one son to New York. And they rebuild their textile industry around the world by having sons in each of those continents. It's a, it's a remarkable story. And she started telling us about these irrelevancies, and look at the book, and we mentioned it. You need to know your own story. You need to know what's relevant to other people. You need to be able to, you know, I run something called the Jewish Achiever Awards. And every year we recognize non remarkable South Africans who are building the post apartheid South Africa. And the awards are coming up on the 19th of November, and we're going to have close to a thousand people in, in the room. And we've got Chilean acrobats swinging from the roof. and and uh, tap dancers that are going to be dancing to Bohemian Rhapsody and Harry Sidropoulos. But we did judging the other day for entrepreneurship. Some of the people walk in in front of the judges and we've got some proper, real, high-powered judges and they can't tell the story of their own business. They can't elevate it. And you think like, surely you must practice I mean, you you filled out 30 pages of forms. You're sitting in front of a um, group of really distinguished entrepreneurs. You're going to tell your story. You're going to try to convince them that you should be winning this prestigious award. And you can't really tell them what you do. What's that possible? Mm -hmm. So I think we all need an elevator pitch for our own lives. And we all need to be able to tell our own stories in a way that's relevant, not to ourselves, but to the people who listen. So when you're talking and giving an elevator pitch or giving any story, is there something that you focus on? Are you focusing on what's the message? Are you focusing on where am I going? What, what's the key focus when you tell a story? I, um, I used to train my staff, many of whom were techies, and would send you a six-page email to a customer. And I would look at this and I'd say, you've got one line. Tell the story in one line. And it has to be the first line. The rest is irrelevant. It will never get read. And that's the thing that we know. I, uh, I, have a friend, I also have a friend. She's now in America called Sonia Berman. She read the Star newspaper every day, but never ever saw an edition. She drove past the posters on, on the trees, and she knew exactly what was happening in, in the country. Who here uh, reads News 24 on the web? Are any of you subscribers? Exactly. We read the headlines. So what's the headline of your life, Dave? That reminds me there's a quote, and I think it's Winston Churchill, who said, I'm writing a long letter because I don't have the time to write a short letter. Yes. <laughs> Use that line often. That's true. Someone said a newspaper sells newspapers by writing the headline and then unpacking the story. And if you read a novel, it's kind of, you've got to read through hundreds of things to get to the reading. So you, you, you give the headline, but you tell the story as if it's a story and we're going to get to who done it. So you've got that gift of the two. Where, where did that gift come from? Or where did you first discover that you're a storyteller? When, when did you start using this? Um, I know I, I, so the honest thing. answer is I have no idea. Like, mm -hmm. I, uh, it's just, I've never trained. I am who I am. Now, interestingly, Yuval Noah Harari, who I'm sure many of you have read his books, and if you haven't, go read all of his books. Sapiens, Homo Deus, 21 Questions for the 21st Century. And one of the things he says is now his, his great gift to humankind, he does Vipassana Yoga. Does anyone the, the silent meditation for a month? And he, with, he conceptualized these remarkable ideas in his head while being completely silent. And interestingly, my niece in Israel just did 12 days of Vipassana, and Yuval Harari was her, her, her teacher. Um, he said that silent, so it's not like he's going to impart much to But he, he has always said, or his greatest gift to, to understanding the world, he says, 
human society actually progresses because we mutually agree to certain myths. And the first myth that we all bought into was the myth of God. Human society with no structure wasn't conducive to progress, but when we believed there was consequence to our actions, when we all as a society believed there was a thing as God, we could actually organize organize into communities and progress because we had to behave ourselves because there's punishment in the artwork. That was the first great myth. The second great myth was the myth of money. The myth that somehow a coin or a piece of paper has value and that we can trade with each other without me moving my sheep or my nail salon or anything else or my telecoms business because we believe in the value of money, but it's a complete myth. There is no value in a piece of pay and flow and accord other than the fact that we've all agreed to it. And of course, Harari says the third great myth that we all agreed to was the myth that came from the Second World War. We all decided to believe in universalism, in human rights, in the dignity of humankind. We weren't going to kill anymore and put, the, put people into gas chambers. We were going to stop wars. We were going to create a combined Europe. We were going to have a United Nations. And the thing that he says in 21 Questions for the 21st Century is... He fears we stop believing in that greatness. Mm. Um, I'm telling you stories because the stories we tell each other are the important stories that allow us to progress. If you think of it, the Bible doesn't deal with myths. It deals with stories because that's the way we learn. And if we want to continue to learn, we need to be able to tell those stories. So that's a great place to ask you about the stories that you've learned from others. So you mentioned you've got five people that you want to share the stories. Maybe it's more. Do you want to share some of the learnings that you've learned from others? So, so Dave and I sat last week to talk about what I was going to talk about. And I said, I want to tell you a story because when Shimon Peres, the former Israeli president, turned 90, he threw a birthday party. And uh, the guest list from the birthday party was... Robert De Niro and Sharon Stone, Barbara Streisand and Bill Clinton and Tony Blair and me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> of course, when Bill Clinton tells the story, the guest list sounds a little different, but that, that's not the point. And one of the people who was there who did a masterclass on happiness was the world expert in happiness, a guy called Daniel Gilbert, Harvard professor. And he says, he says, you know, when I was young, my mother said to me, there are three lessons to how to be happy in life. You must get married, have children, and have a good job. And he asks us to vote. Do you think those things will bring us happiness? And maybe I'll ask you to vote. So does marriage bring you happiness? Why? You've got some yeses, some no's. Our audience votes, vote, votes no. Do children bring you happiness? Yes. And grandchildren too. <laughs> Does money bring you happiness? So, so Daniel Gilbert has worked out a way to determine how happy we all are. And it's interestingly because like oh, everyone's kind of that. That's level of happiness. So they're going to see, well, what can in fact affect your level of happiness? So they go to the people they think are the most miserable people in the world. They go to conjoined twins. They can't move independently. They've been stuck together the entire lives and they measure how happy they are. You know how happy they are? Exactly the same as you and me. So then they think, okay, there must be people who are really happy and people who are really miserable. We must go measure them. Lottery winners, true. Happiness like you can't believe. Quadriplegics, misery like you can't believe. And two years later, they go measure them again. And they're as happy as you and me. There's no lasting happiness. So what is it that will create happiness? And they go to research to see if Daniel Gilbert's mother lied to him. And it turns out she did. <laughs> Interestingly, married people are slightly happier than unmarried pe people. But just by a fraction, unless you're in a bad marriage, in which case you must get out as quickly as you can because that's the most miserable group they've ever measured. They go to mothers who are looking after their children. 
and like their kids are vomiting on them and they're pooing on them and they say, would you rather be here or would you rather be at work? And they say, we'd rather be at work. Would you rather be here or would you rather be with your friends? We'd rather be with our friends. But interestingly, the next day, and they go back to the exact same mothers and they say, tell us about yesterday. And the mother says, oh, wonderful, my kid was fantastic. And they said, no, 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 she wasn't. We were here, she was vomiting and pooing all over you. You were miserable as hell. And they worked out the human brain, in fact, ha has been programmed by evolution to make you forget the misery. Mm. Because it's so hard to rear a kid that you'll never have a second kid if you remembered how hard it was the, the first time around. The only thing you can remember is the last thing that happened in the day and the highlight of the day. Mothers physically cannot remember how miserable they were the day before with their children. So the answer is actually kids don't bring their happiness. The third question of whether money brings you happiness, turns out it's the wrong question. Because the answer is the lack of money brings you misery, but money does not bring you happiness. And in America, they've measured that at $72,000 a year. If you earn less than $72,000 a year, you're always worried about, can we afford this? Can we do something? But the moment that you reach $72,000, it's no longer a factor. You go on and you live your life. You achieve a level of happiness that you didn't have below $72,000. The difference, I'm coming to you in the question, I hope that we, oh, okay. <laughs> The difference between, in fact, $72,000 a year and $200,000 a year is statistically insignificant. You're no much more happier any, as long as you pass the minimum threshold. So there's certain questions that we have to ask, not just about happiness, but how do we achieve it? And the only thing they've worked out that achieves happiness is not buying a cop, is not buying a diamond ring. Because they worked out, you go buy yourself a diamond ring or you give a, get a necklace as a gift, your level of happiness goes up. In 52 days, back down to exactly where it was before. So you need a diamond ring every 52, every 52 <laughs> days, in fact. <laughs> the only thing I'll come to you in a second, the only thing that they found out that brings you lasting happiness are life experiences. Going to a remarkable restaurant, going in a hot air balloon, Travel is the one thing that brings you lasting happiness. Your level of happiness goes up and stays up for a period of two years. And the more you can tell people about your experience, the longer it lasts. The more effort that you've put into organizing your trip, the longer it lasts. If you go to a travel agent and you allow the travel agent to organize your trip and you go as a participant rather than a plan planner, your level of happiness will drop much quicker. But if you put in the effort yourself, you did the research, you looked at all the hotels, you worked out how to do that, a minimum of two years, remarkably higher measure of happiness. Oh. Kathy Kayla always talks about, and I think that's how you know it, because I did float down the jungles of Borneo on a boat visiting the orangutan sanctuaries, uh, which is an amazing story, but I've been to 77 countries. Like, every, I want to see everything. I, uh, I want to taste and I want to smell. And I want to give you an example of my Morocco trip that, been on so there were four of us traveling together and we booked separately i'd like book my hotel two of my friends from america were coming with earl golden and his wife would look and they said no uh we want something a little more expensive <laughs> now i don't quite understand something a little more expensive because anyway they are we paid on average i think 70 to 100 dollars per room per night they paid on average 200 dollars a night and they stayed in Western hotels right. where they never met a single Moroccan. When they the food was Western food, they should have stayed in Chicago. We stayed in these spectacular little riads run by Moroccans who would say, come, come with us, come out clubbing with us tonight, come to restaurants with us. The one set up a table on top of a square in the in middle of Fez and hosted us for dinner. So that's the approach that I have to go and in a country, I walk into a restaurant and if everyone's a tourist, I walk straight out. So whether it's going to see the, the orangutans or walking through the Valley of Kings and going into the tomb of Tutankhamun or going to hiking up Machu Picchu or uh, 
stargazing in the deserts of Atacama in Chile. Like those are the life experiences that enriched my life. And that's what's made my life to me remarkable. I was going to come on to the ne- to that as my next point because I don't know if you know what blue zones are. No. They travel the world to find out where people live longer than average normal people. And they found there's a spot in Japan, there's a spot in Italy, there's a spot in South America. And they go and they try to work out what is it that those spots, what, why are people living longer than everywhere else? Mm-hmm. And they've come up with two things, and it's not genetics. And it's not the fact that they don't smoke or drink, because many of these people do. And the two things that they discovered is interconnectedness with other people. Yeah. If you have a support group, if you have friends, if you still socialize, your chances of living longer, much, much higher. And the second element is finding meaning in your day to day. In many of these places, like in Italy, they find the 105 year old going out into the orchards and picking olives. They still believe they're productive members of society. They still participate in communal events. It's that meaning and the interconnectedness that are really the secrets to longevity. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, you know, I was going to mention that, but also, I mean, it's not enough to talk about physical health, mental health. We just saturate, you know, in the scale of happiness. So, so, so obviously, health brings a, a huge amount in. And, you know, there's this quest at the moment to live long, but it's the wrong quest because we're living longer with disease. We need to live longer without disease. So if I could recommend a book that I'm reading at the moment, I'm not a Tony Robbins fan, but his new book, Life Force, where he's going through the latest technologies in everything in order to create a healthier, longer life. I think it's a great read. I would certainly, certainly recommend it. The BBC did a survey on quality of life in retired situations, and they interviewed a group of people and went back to that same group 10 years later to see and there were three defining things that gave them contentment in retirement and the one most important one was don't lose your network that was the most critical there are many others of having a vocation financial security but the core element that we used to put up in late life don't lose your network yeah i think that's a great lesson so should we talk about another lesson Dave? absolutely because um, at the conference, I met a little lady that tall who I just said hello to, but turns out a few years later, she came to South Africa and I hosted her for a week and it was... Yeah. No, it was Dr. Ruth. Yeah. Dr. Ruth, the w- world's most famous sex therapist, mm-hmm. today age 94. Mm-hmm. And she came to South Africa and this woman ran me off my feet. I couldn't go. Yeah. She landed... And I get a call to say, what are we doing? And I said, well, you must rest. You've just come up an 18-hour flight from New York. I'll pick you up for dinner tonight. And she said, I want a massage now for an hour, and then you're taking me out. And so we went to Melrose Art. We went down the road to Nelson Mandela's home. And wherever she went, we would like walk into the toilet. And she would say to me, I need to tip the person because that could have been me. And the car attendant, she said, have you tipped him? Because that could have been me. And I sat her down and said, like, what do you mean that could have been me? And she told me the most amazing story about her life. She was a 10-year-old kid growing up in Germany. The Nazis were on the rise. And her parents put her on a train and sent her to Switzerland. And she never saw her parents again. She arrived as an orphan in Switzerland. They accommodated her during the war, never had any schooling, nothing. As soon as the war is over, she gets on a boat and she goes to Israel and she joins the Israeli underground fighting against the British colonialization of Israel at the time. And she becomes a sniper in the Israeli army fighting against the British. She tells me she lost her virginity on a haystack with her gun next to her side. <laughs> this little <laughs> war. And the war's coming to, to an end. And she's 22 years old now, and she wants, she has no education, and she gets admitted into a teacher's training college. And it's her birthday. And one of the other students in the teacher's training college gives her a book as a birthday present. This is the first gift she's gotten since she saw her parents. 
12 years before. And suddenly the air raid sirens go off. And they rush down to the air, air raid shelter and she realizes she's left her book upstairs, her only gift, her only possession. And she runs back to get it just as a bomb hits the it teachers at the training uh, center. Her legs are shredded. She spends the next year in hospital next to a wounded soldier and they make a pact. If they survive, they're going to get married. And they do. He gets a scholarship to go study at the Sorbonne. She goes as well. She gets a degree in social work at the Sorbonne. The marriage fails. She doesn't know what to do. She's got an uncle in New York. She gets on a boat. She sails to New York. And she, as she lands, she sees they're offering scholarships to Holocaust survivors. And she goes and she works at New York University as a social worker. And she's teaching there. And one day, she's the most junior person of the faculty. One day, the secretary of the faculty comes in and says, we've just had a request from the Broadcasting Association of America. They're having a conference in New York, and they want someone to come and talk why, about why sex is a taboo subject and you can't discuss it on the radio and television. And all the senior professors say how much they pay them. <laughs> and they say, no, they're not paying anything. And they all say no. And Dr. Roos says, well, someone must go. I'll go. And she goes to the talk and someone there's listening from NBC and says to her, maybe it's actually not right. Maybe we can't talk about sex on the radio. And so they give her the midnight slot on Sunday night on New York radio to see if anyone will listen. <laughs> it's so popular that within a week, they move it to the 10, 10 p.m. slot. It's so popular that they move it from Sunday to every day of the week. It's so popular that they give her an afternoon talk show. It's so popular that they put her on TV every single afternoon in America. She was Oprah Winfrey before Oprah Winfrey. As we took her around South Africa, no one here recognized her because we didn't have it. Every American tourist stopped. We were run off the road on the way to Soweto by a group of American tourists who saw Dr. Ruth who wanted to meet her. And when she told me the story, it was a story about opportunity. About if you only do things because there's money, you're going to miss all the opportunities out there. She became a multi, multi millionaire because she grabbed the opportunities, because she could have been that toilet attendant if not for a little quirk of fate. And how every opportunity that we see, we need to grab because you never know where it's going to, to, to actually land up. And she told me a beautiful story because she said she was always really embarrassed about what she did for a living. And Mr. Westheimer, her husband, she said, ah, she just never felt comfortable that he should ever come to any of her talks. Like it wasn't right that her husband should be listening to his wife talk about sex. And she said, one day Diane Sawyer from 60 Minutes, the most popular presenter in America, says, can I come to your home and film you? We want to film a segment. But she knew her husband had a huge crush on, on Diane Sawyer. <laughs> and she says, there's one time you can stay because I know you want to meet Diane Sawyer. And so Diane Sawyer comes, puts the two of them on the couch together, and suddenly turns to Mr. Westheimer and says, tell me, Mr. Westheimer, how's your sex life? <laughs> <laughs> and he says on TV, the cobbler's children have no shoes. <laughs> But I think the second lesson and the lesson that I learned from Dr. Ruth is grab every opportunity that comes before you. That's the path of the unknown. That's the things that we have to explore. When Orchet comes and says, are you prepared to do an in the boardroom a day? Grab it. Because who knows what happens? Mm -hmm. Life is about those experiences. It's a journey. It's not a destination. And that for me is lesson number two. I want to I want to talk about maybe a third class lesson. And uh, at the conference was was Dan Ariely. Now you know Dan Ariely because you lecture behavioral economics. And Dan Ariely is one of my great heroes in life. He's an Israeli behavioral economist, probably the most famous behavioral economist in the world. And I've read all of his books, and I see him there. And he's disfigured. Half of his face is like completely disfigured. And I'll go up to him and say, like, I wanted to meet you for so long. Um, I'm from South Africa. And his first question is, do you know Adrian Gore? Mm -hmm. And I say, yeah, I know Adrian Gore. He says, you know that vitality program, that's mine. 
mm. he designed the Vitality program. It turns out he actually designed the Shabbos program a project as well. Um, but I, I felt I had to bond with him, so we poured a lot of tequila down each other's throats. <laughs> and he has the most amazing story because he was in the army and an ordinance explodes. He gets third degree burns over about 90% of his body, completely disfigured. He's in the hospital for over a year. And the thing that obsesses him is that every day they come to change his bandages. And should they take them off really fast with excruciating pain? Or should they take them off slower with less pain? And he says to all of the nurses, if I ever get out of here, I'm going to devote my life to, in fact, deciding that very question. How must the nurse take off your band? He goes, he does a PhD in psychology, and he comes back to the nurses and says, you were wrong. You should have taken my bandages off really fast with excruciating pain. That's the right answer. I've been researched that that's the right answer. And the nurses say, no, you're wrong. You're only thinking about yourself. You're not thinking about the pain that we went through every time we had to take off your bandages. And that sets him on a path to say that the obvious answer is not always the obvious answer. One of, one of the great proponents of behavioral economics had an insight when I went to a talk by his, which said they realized that, for example, dishwashers are not there to wash your dishes. Dishwashers are places to put your dishes into until they get washed. <laughs> and Dan Ariely becomes a professor at MIT and decides to devote much of his time to honesty. And so they do this interesting experiment. They have a maths test. They know the average is going to be seven. They've tested it on tens of thousands of people. The average is always seven. But they give the students a maths test. And they say, do the maths test. Mark it yourself. Rip it up. Throw it away. Come tell us how you did on the maths test. The average goes up to seven point something. People can test a tiny little. Then they say, okay, do the maths test. Mark it yourself. Rip it up. Throw it away. For every right answer you get, we're going to give you a dollar. Slightly increase. People cheat slightly more because there's money involved. And then they do something. Do the maths test. Mark it yourself. Rip it up. Come tell us how you did and we'll give you a plastic token. You can take your plastic token to the next table and they'll give you a dollar for every right the answer you got with your plastic token and suddenly the average goes up to nine because cheating and stealing is wrong but the moment you divorce yourself away from the money your plastic token even though at the next table that plastic token becomes money people cheat much more honesty disappears in the exact same way that they've discovered that people cheat more with credit card plastic than they do with rand's cash because we divorced from this idea yeah. of money. And he comes to South Africa, and because I've thrown so much tequila down his throat, I feel we have to bond again and maybe have some more tequila. And so I call him up, and it happens that that is the day that Jacob Zuma may or may not resign. And he says to me, you know, you're at a very important moment in South African history today. You can do a deal. Cyril Ramaphosa can go up to him and say, I give you amnesty, get out of office, keep whatever you've got, and we'll get on and improve the country. Or you can say, no, no, no. We will never give you amnesty. Justice is more important. He said, what's the right on answer? And I say, well, I think we need to save South Africa. Let's give him amnesty and get rid of him and get on with our lives and try and rebuild the country. And you know what Dan Ariely says? You're wrong. He said, if you give him amnesty, you tell him Cyril Ramaphosa he can steal as much as he wants because you've set the precedent. Because you can never backtrack on morality. The moment you've cheated once, you'll cheat again. If you've given a 10 rand bribe to a traffic officer, you'll give a 1,000 rand bribe next time. The slope of morality is a downward slope. You breach it once, you breach it forever. You can never, ever in fact, recover from a breach of morality. And that was a very important lesson because I think every single day we faced in South Africa with these challenges because 
At night, sometimes you go through a red traffic light and the police officer is behind you. And at sometimes you go to home affairs and maybe you can get something done a bit quicker. But morality is a downward slope. And the lesson from Dan Marie really is there's no going back if we compromise. This is the time to be morally and ethically strong. Dave, I don't know how we're doing on time. No. Got, I'm going to go to one more lesson, maybe. We're running a little bit out of time, but we talk about <coughs> saving South Africa. So you've got an amazing story about when you were part of the IC, how you actually saved South Africa, which I think is a wonderful story to, to share. Well, I didn't save South Africa, but I'm going to tell you about two people who worked for me. So uh, during the 1994 elections, I ran the investigations unit in Caltech, and I had I had uh, 36 lawyers working for me. And if someone was trying to bribe you or prevent you from voting or doing something, you would call up my department and I would send out one of these lawyers and they would come and in fact prosecute you. And one day we got a call from a farm worker from Perimacan to say that their farmer won't allow them to vote in the 27th of April. And so I call over two of my investigators. There's a guy called Mohammed Jajbai and a big Afrikaans burly investigator called Victor. And I say to them, guys, get into the car, go to Ferena, sit down with this farmer and explain to him that he's either going to let his, vote, his staff vote or else you're going to put him in jail. And Victor says, I'm not going with him. And he points to Mohammed Jajbai. <laughs> and I say, why? He says, He's black. He says, I've never been in a car with a black person and I'm not starting that one. And I do, you do know you're working on the country's first democratic elections. And I said, you two have a choice. You can go back to the prosecutor's office at half your salary before I seconded you to me. Or alternatively, you get into the car with Judge Bai. And Judge Bai had a fantastic sense of humor because he said, oh, by the way, I'm driving. <laughs> and it's amazing because economics always wins. And so rather than cut his salary in half, Victor got into the car with Judge Bai and they go for about four or five hours. They come back and Victor calls me aside. He said, do you know Judge Bai is a genius? I said, well, he's a senior counsel advocate. There was a pretty good chance he was going to be smart. He says, you know something? I think we'll be friends for the rest of our lives. Mm -hmm. And when Judge Bai died about six or seven years ago, Victor was at his funeral. And they sat me down and they told me an amazing story about Ferena. They go to the farmer. The farmer and his wife invite them onto the stoop and give give them tea and cook sisters. I don't think Judge Bai had ever seen a cook sister in his life before. And he says, oh, we don't know where they're getting the story from. Of course we're going to allow everyone on the farm to vote. And so happily they get back into their car, which has IC plates on the side. They're driving off the farm where one of the farm workers stops them. He says, you see that chicken shed over there? They don't allow black people into the chicken shed anymore. And he gives them a lump of lead, which they give to him. And I don't know what you use lead for. Maybe I'm poorly educated, other than to make bullets. And so I call National Intelligence and ANC Intelligence who are in our building. And I said, guys, I need you to, uh, to raid a chicken shed on a farm in Ferena. And for those of you who are too young to remember what 1994 was like, bombs were going off all over Johannesburg. The ANC officers in the center of town exploded. Oa Tambo had been blow, blown up. There were shootings in places like Bukutatswana between the AWB and, and Lucas Mangopi's forces and the ANC. The country was in chaos. And national intelligence raids the chicken farm and discovers the bomb manufacturing plant that was used to blow up Oatampo Airport and the ANC officers and make the bullets that were being used as the homelands tried to do. And because of that, Victor and Judge Bar saved South Africa. Two people working together who wouldn't get into a car together, got into a car together, came out as friends for the rest of their lives and impacted all of our lives. And that's one of the greatest lessons that we can all learn about South Africa is a country of amazing talent and amazing people, but maybe a lack of opportunity. We just have to be able to create the opportunities for people to work together, to understand each other, 
and we can do amazing things. And I know you want to close and we've run over time. I want to leave you with one thought from Shimon Peres. Because someone went to him and he, he, had, he was a statesman, he died at page 94, and said to him, President Peres, you've lived a remarkable life. You've lived through many wars. You've been a commander in wars. You've seen so much in your time. How do you remain an optimist? And he said, optimists and pessimists all die the same. But they lead very different lives. So may you go on and lead a remarkable life as an optimist as well. So thank you for your time. Oh. Wow, um, I think today far exceeded all our expectations. You had very low expectations. As, <laughs> as usual. And um, we started this morning with a, with a question, who is smart? And smart people learn from other people. Today we take out a lesson of learnings from you. Um, thank you on behalf of Jet for the exceptional in the boardroom, the last one of 2022. And to David Seidel, who has hosted every single in the boardroom live and webinar session for Altjet over the years. We close today thanking you, David, for your time, your research, your pre-interview discussions, questions, and thank, thank you so much, Dave. Howard, we are so excited to work with you again, too, very, very soon. I know when we last spoke, you were on your camel in the middle of somewhere, <laughs> and I was trying to get some content. Um, and when I saw you at our last in the boardroom, I said to you, please do one more for us this year. So, so grateful that you have given us your time this morning. And it was really, really incredible. Thank you all. <laughs> And I do know that Howard had a few other stories oh, that he would have liked to share. So <laughs> I want to maybe for next year, if Howard's happy to do it, yes, and you follow the we the people are asking. <laughs> if you can join us. Thank you very much. I'm David Zeidel and I look forward to seeing you next time in the boardroom.